Welcome to the United Church of Assonet. The meditation this morning is, Dear God, my mind can be a scary place and I fear so much. Please give me your peace. And that is from our daily bread. Please join me in the call to worship printed in your bulletin. O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from far away. Search out my path and my lying down, and are acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, O Lord, you know it completely. You hem me in, behind and before, and lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is so high that I cannot attain it. For it was you that formed my inward parts, you knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works that I know very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes beheld my unformed substance. In your book were written all the days that were formed for me when none of them as yet existed. How weighty to me are your thoughts, O God. How vast is the sum of them. I, I try, try to, to count, count them. them. They, they are, are more, more than, than the sand. sand. I, I come, come to the end. end. I am still with you. Our opening hymn this morning is Ye Servants of God, Your Master Proclaim. It can be found in the Red Pilgrim Hymnal, and it's number 206. Please stand to sing if you're comfortable and able. Oh, 
ascribing salvation to Jesus our King. Salvation to God who sits on the throne. Let all cry aloud and honor the Son. The praises of Jesus, the angels Continuing with the invocation followed by the Lord's Prayer. Sovereign One, we acknowledge your presence among us. Stir up the gifts you have planted among us. Hold us in your care and present a mirror before us so that we may know ourselves as you have known us. Strengthen us in your mercy and let your grace propel us to renewal and righteousness. Let us so that we might rise in spirit and in truth for your glory. We pray as Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors, and lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. be seated. Good morning once again and welcome to the United Church of Sonnet on this beautiful winter morning. Um, and for those of you who are new to our worship, welcome. We hope you find a warm welcome amongst us this morning. Um, the announcements this morning are printed on the back of your bulletin. Um, we continue to need people to sign up for flowers, and the sign-up sheet is in the narthex. Um, there are two weeks left in January, and those two are open, as well as the last three weeks of February. And Susan, thank you so much for the flowers that are on the altar this morning. She says she's, she's welcoming spring. I think she's jumping the gun a little bit, but I'll let it go. But they are beautiful. Thank you. Um, we will be continuing with the Bible sub study of Isaiah on Tuesday, this coming Tuesday, the 16th at 6 p.m. Um, anyone who's participating can read Isaiah um, 1 to 5 if you're able, and all are welcome to attend that. The annual meeting this year is on January 28th, immediately following the church service, and after the meeting we'll be having soup and some sweets, so please plan on having lunch here. Um, and the soup will be provided, but if somebody was willing to bake, I, I don't know anybody who bakes, do you? Anyway, <laughs> I think there'll be some cookies there. Sandy, there will be some molasses cookies there, I promise. Um, so if anybody else is willing to bake, that would be well uh, welcomed. 
Um, we continue to collect non-perishable food items and they can be left in the, the narthex and those are for the pantry, the food pantry, the local one. Also, Reverend Baker's blog can be found on his website, which is listed here as well. And he, he is also available on Fridays in his office for anyone who wishes to see him and you can talk, contact him if you have a request for that. Is there, are there any other announcements this morning? No, okay. It's all you, sir. Juggling all these people. Good morning, everyone. Nice to see everyone today. I'd like to say welcome to Susan's family. Thank you for joining us. Um, I did want to make uh, a reference to uh, what, what Susan had to say, and that is, well, spring is only three weeks away if you're a groundhog. So we'll see how that goes once we get there. Um, I just wanted to indicate uh, for the Bible study this uh, coming Tuesday, um, again, we're studying Isaiah, and I think we had a wonderful time, our first session, and hopefully you can make it out for the, the rest of the sessions. Uh, on Friday, I had a meeting with the other local clergy, as I do every Friday for breakfast, and we sort of set down the plan for the Soup and Scripture series for Lent this year. Um, we will be hosting the very last session on March 27th during Holy Week. So that gives us plenty of time to prepare, but I wanted you all to be aware of that, and as uh, soon as we have the flyer for the rest of the sessions, that will be wonderful. We'll have the first one on February 24th first I believe right uh, there, yeah I was just gonna say I forgot to mention Kathy made coffee and there are some little snacks downstairs so after service please come down yep, yep. Th those are actually partly left over from the game night that we had uh, last evening which was a wonderful time and uh, for those of you who were unable to join us I know that there were some family conflicts work conflicts uh, hopefully you'll be able to join us next time in a couple months are there any further announcements? Then let us um, move on to our time of joy and concern. We have our uh, prayers today for uh, Leon uh, Cudworth Sr. and for Leon Cudworth Jr. for that matter, for Anne Marie Allen, for Dick Field, uh, for uh, Tiff and for Kim Vonica, uh, for Eunice, uh, for Mary, for Millie Moore, for Pat Gonsalves, for Nick Riccardi, for Bethany Costa, for Bobby Files, for Tony Ravello, for Franklin McMullen, for David Rizuski, and for Audrey DeMora. Are there any prayers or updates? Yes? Ricky? Right. Who is that? Ray. Ray. Ray and Roy, okay. <coughs> yep, so uh, Ricky is having surgery on Friday for his thumb, right? And um, then Ray and Roy got the help they needed uh, this week, so uh, prayers for them. Other prayer requests this morning? Then let us all pray together. Lord of love and life, there is a call for those who are willing to listen. It echoes fatally in the world around us, in the lives of the people around us, and in all creation. For your grace and glory, we offer you our praise, not only at this moment, but always. We praise you in good times and bad and ask your help in praising you when we forget. For it is easy to put ourselves before you and to follow old ways of doing things, which ultimately bring neither peace nor happiness to us and the world. Hear our honest confessions of our sins and forgive us so we might be restored to relationship with you. Hear our thanksgiving for restoration and for all the other blessings in our lives. And hear our prayers for a world that is so full of need. 
And on this weekend, remembering Dr. King, we pray that true racial understanding and reconciliation might be possible, and that true equality of dignity and opportunity may appear beyond empty words and gestures. We pray that there be peace in the many war-torn areas of our world. We pray for those who have been touched by extreme weather this week. We pray for those who have no place to rest in the bitter cold of winter and for all who struggle to have enough to thrive. We pray for those who sacrifice for the sake of others, from our military, first responders, health care, workers, and teachers to those who raise children and care for elderly parents. We pray that we might break the cycles of addiction and self-destructive behavior. We pray for all facing surgery and cancer treatment and all who face recovery or any other health challenges. We pray especially for Leon and for Leon, for Anne-Marie and for Dick, for Tiff and for Kim, for Eunice and for Mary, for Millie and for Pat, for Nick and for Bethany, for Bobby and for Tony, for Franklin McMullen, and for David and for Audrey, for Ricky and Ray and Roy. Hear now the silent prayers of our hearts as we hear your call for us. Lord, listen to our prayers and help us to answer your call. As we pray in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. The generous life rests on gratitude and trust in God's abundance. As we give, we acknowledge that we have communally received more than enough to meet our collective needs. And our offerings serve to realize this reign of God's kingdom on earth. This morning's offering will now be received.
us pray. Generous God, cultivate and nurture gratitude and trust in us. May our gifts be used for the benefit of the kingdom of God and all creation in your name. Amen. <coughs> You may be seated. So I heard a story today about a girl named Jane. Uh, Jane is uh, four years old and she likes to think of herself as a big girl and she doesn't like to have any help. She says, I can do it myself. Did anyone have a child or was a child that used to do those things? Okay. You know, I know that uh, I'm the oldest child in my family and I'm used to sort of trying to help other people and my youngest uh, sister was the baby and she, everyone was always doing things for her. But my, the middle sister, my uh, younger sister Melissa was always, I'll do it myself, you know, always very stubborn about these things. And I think Jane was, was very much the same way. And um, one day Jane heard the story that we're going to hear in a few minutes uh, from the, about the Samuel when he was a young boy and how essentially when Samuel heard the cry of God, he said, here I am, God, how can I help you? And Jane was, was kind of taken aback because it had never crossed her mind that she could help other people because she was so used to have people constantly saying, what can I do to help you? What can I do to help you? And it completely changed her understanding about God or about her kind of place in her family and her place in the larger, her larger church family. You know, um, because no matter who we are or how small we feel, there's always a way that we can help. Even at the times when we are having the most difficulty, when we are the most stressed out when we feel there's nothing that we can do the times when we need help there's always some sort of help that we can offer up even if it's just a simple word of prayer and so i hope that as we look around what we're going to be doing this week um, we can uh, ask each other how can i help you and so uh, would you please pray with me Please repeat after me. Dear Lord, thank you for those who help me. Help me to help others. Amen. All right, our uh, hymn of preparation this morning can be found as an insert in your hymnal. It is, Here I Am, Lord. Uh, let us all stand and uh, we can all sing together.
This morning's Old Testament lesson is from 1 Samuel. It's chapter 3, verses 1 through 20. It can be found on pages 224 and 225 in your pew Bibles. Now the boy Samuel was ministering to the Lord under Eli. The word of the Lord was rare in those de days. Visions were not widespread. At that time, Eli's, whose eyesight had begun to grow dim so that he could not see, was lying down in his room. The lamp of God had not yet gone out, and Samuel was lying down in the temple of the Lord, where the ark of God was. Then the Lord called, Samuel, Samuel. And he said, Here I am, and ran to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. But he said, I did not call. Lie down again. So he went and lay down. The Lord called again, Samuel. Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. But he said, I did not call, my son. Lie down again. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, and the, the word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. The Lord called Samuel again a third time, and he got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. Then Eli perceived that the Lord was calling the boy. Therefore Eli said to Samuel, Go lie down, and if he calls you, you shall say, Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. For your servant, So Samuel went and lay down in his place. Now the Lord came and stood there, calling as before, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel said, Speak, for your servant is listening. Then the Lord said to Samuel, See, I am about to do something in Israel that will make both ears of anyone who hears of it tingle. On that day, I will fulfill against Eli all that I have spoken concerning his house from beginning to end. For I have told him that I am about to punish his house forever for the iniquity that he knew, because his sons were blaspheming God, and he did not restrain them. Therefore, I swear to the house of Eli that the iniquity of Eli's house shall not be expiated by sacrifice or offering forever. Samuel lay there until morning, and when he opened the doors of the house of the Lord, Samuel was afraid to tell the vision to Eli. But Eli called Samuel and said, Samuel, my son, he said, here I am. Eli said, what was it that, that he told you? Do not hide it from me. May God do so to you, and more also, if you hide anything from me of all that he told you. So Samuel told him everything and hid nothing, about, nothing from him. Then he said, It is the Lord. Let him do what seems good to him. As Samuel grew up, the Lord was with him and let none of his w words fall to the ground. And all Israel, from Dan to Beer... Beersheba knew that Samuel was a trustworthy prophet of the Lord. The Lord continued to appear at Shiloh, for the Lord revealed himself to Samuel at Shiloh by the, the word of the Lord, and the word of Samuel came to all of Israel. The Gospel reading this morning is John. It's chapter 1, verses 40 through for 51. It can be found on page 779 in your pew Bibles. The next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, Follow me. Now that Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter, Philip found Nathanael and said to him, We have found him about whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus, son of Joseph from Nazareth. Nathanael called to him, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said, come. Philip said to him, Come and see. When Jesus saw Nathanael coming to, toward him, he said of him, Here is truly an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael asked him, Where did you get to know me? Jesus answered, I saw you under the fig tree before Philip called you. Nathanael replied, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Jesus answered, Do you believe because I told, that, told you that I saw you under the fig tree? You will see greater things than these. And he said to him, Very truly I tell you, you will see heaven opened up and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. And so endeth the reading.
Good morning again, everyone. Should have brought sunglasses there, Dick. <laughs> All right. So I'm taking my son Finn back to college this afternoon, and as I was th as I was thinking about how he was, he's now 18 years old. He's legally an adult, and he's becoming mature and responsible in many ways. But not every way. And he still leaves messes everywhere and procrastinates doing important things and forgot that he had to wash his, um, his sheets before he went back to school. So he's rushing doing that this morning. But he's no longer that little baby that needed help with everything. He's getting to the point where he actually can do it all himself. But my sentimental thoughts about the passage of time were triggered by an important event that happened this week in uh, New England sports history, and that was the firing of Bill Belichick. All right. Belichick had been the head coach of the New England Patriots since 2000. It was a run of 24 years. He won six Super Bowls, nine conference titles, and 17 division titles. He won 266 regular season games with the Patriots. Now, to put all of this in perspective, in 2000, I had just graduated from college when he began as a head coach. I had not even met my wife yet. And so all of my adult life, Belichick was the coach of my favorite football team. And most of that time, Tom Brady was the quarterback, and the Patriots were generally uh, the best team in the NFL. So my adult ish son and an entire generation of new england football fans never knew a patriots team where belichick was not the head coach this is a big change now during my childhood the patriots were a lousy football team so i feel like it's kind of a cycle that's coming back around again when i was in second grade the patriots appeared in their very first super bowl this was in early 1986 and a boy on the school bus bet me five dollars that the bears would win now not really knowing anything about football i bet on the patriots out of loyalty and as we all know the pats were annihilated by the bears in one of the most lopsided losses of all time and so i reluctantly got the five dollars and paid it up and that's one reason why i never gamble again uh, another good reason is I had a really good feeling about Cleveland yesterday that did not end up happening. And, you know, my father and uncle and I would used to go to Patriots games, you know, rarely, at the old Foxborough Stadium, which at the time was called Sullivan Stadium. Anyone ever been to that stadium? Okay, a couple of people. So I remember the dirt roads behind the stadium so you could go in to do tailgating. And uh, I remember that I got into the games for free because I was small enough that I could squeeze in on those long metal benches they used to have because they didn't have individual seats like they do today. In a lot of ways, it was more of a high school stadium than a professional stadium. And I remember that the fans at Sullivan Stadium had such a bad reputation that the NFL would never schedule a Monday night football game so they wouldn't embarrass the league. I remember that many home games did not air on television because the stadium didn't sell out. I remember seeing the ineptitude of owners and coaches and players. I remember threats to relocate the team to Hartford or St. Louis. Everything was bad. Things needed to change, but with the arrival of Bill Parcells and Robert Kraft and Bill Belichick, a winning philosophy arrived, ultimately known as the Patriot Way. They came out as a team rather than individuals at that first Super Bowl in 2001. They had slogans like, do your job and no days off, and it worked. It worked so well, it worked better than pretty much any team in the NFL until it didn't. When Tom Brady left the Patriots in many ways because Belichick wanted to get rid of him too soon rather than too late, there was no viable backup plan for quarterback. The quarterbacks like Cam Newton and Mac Jones didn't pan out. The roster got worse and worse to the point where the Pats went from being a mediocre team to a really terrible one. And it was clear that Belichick had become part of the problem rather than the solution. You know, his personnel decisions led to this bad place, and it's a game and in some ways was, was passing him by, well, until he joins, you know, the, the Falcons and wins a Super Bowl next season. But, but the writing was on the wall 
that Belichick had to go after those back-to-back -back blowout losses to the Cowboys and the Saints in which they were outscored 72-3 to and was pretty much set in stone when the Pats had a frustrating loss to the Colts on the international stage in Frankfurt. One of my colleagues in ministry is a very big Pats fan and refuses to schedule any worship and work when the Pats are playing. You might recall that game in Frankfurt was in the morning over here, was during church. And he obviously had to do church <laughs> rather than watch the game. But I talked to him later that afternoon and he said, I don't want to know, I don't want to know. And I'm like, yeah, you, you don't want to know. <laughs> All right. So things had worked really, really well. Everything that was horrible was great and wonderful until it changed. It was time for something new. It was time to break with the past, as wonderful as it had been, to move on to a new era, a new way of doing things. These kind of things where things work really, really well for us until they don't are not unusual. Everything that comes up invariably comes down again, and we need to be open to new ways of getting it back up. This is not true only for sports. It's true for how we relate to God and how God guides us through history. We can see this in our lesson uh, today from the first book of Samuel. Now, this was a time of transition in the history of Israel. For years, uh, the Israelites had been led by judges who weren't necessarily people in powdered wings who made legal decisions, but uh, great heroes like Deborah or Gideon who would arise to deliver the tribes from their enemies. These were great teachers. These were these great warlords, great generals. Now, in our story, the current judge of Israel was a man named Eli who was a rise priest rather than a warrior. But he, as wonderful as he was as an individual, he was unable to rein in his sons, who were notorious for abusing their priestly positions and defrauding the faithful. The judges' system that had worked so well for hundreds of years for the Israelites was no longer working. It was time for something new. And this new thing was in the form of a young boy named Samuel, who would be the last of the judges, but the first of the prophets. As we heard in the story, this was a time when the visions of God and the word of God coming forth was almost unheard of. And Samuel's mother, a woman named Hannah, had been unable to have children, but when she prayed with Eli at the sanctuary in Shiloh, the Lord granted her a son, and in gratitude she devoted that son to the service of the Lord at the sanctuary. He became a servant to the now aging priest Eli. Now one night, the voice of the Lord calls down, Samuel, Samuel, and three times Samuel rushes off to see Eli, to see what he wants. He thinks that his master has summoned him, but each time Eli says that he had not. So the final time, that fourth time, Eli then tells Samuel to answer that voice that's calling him by saying, Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. Essentially, what can I do to help you? So when that call does come, the next time, Samuel answers the Lord. And he's told that it is his destiny to replace Eli not only as a leader of the people, for his sons have destabilized that priesthood. Uh, Samuel is to become not only a leader and a priest, but a prophet. One who sees visions and one who speaks in the name of the Lord. Through Samuel, God is now going to do a new thing. There's a break with the old way, and, but from that new beginning will come ultimately a closer relationship with God, a God that speaks directly to the people. Samuel was a novel figure, but what God gave the world through Jesus was something completely new. Our gospel lesson from the gospel according to John tells us of some of the first followers of Jesus. One was Philip, who then tells his friend Nathaniel about Jesus, saying, We have found him about whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus, the son of Joseph, from Nazareth. Now Nathaniel is surprised and says, 
Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Now Riley Philip answers, come and see. Nathaniel soon comes to believe when Jesus uh, seems to understand who he is before they even meet. Now there are a lot of interesting things that we could examine in this story, but I just want to focus on that one thing, and that's Nathan's reaction. Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Now there's a hint of snobbery in what Nathaniel's saying in here. Can anything of value come from such a backwater place as Nazareth? But here again, God is making a break with the old. Now about 200 years earlier, a royal family called the Hasmoneans had led a revolt against what was called the Seleucid Empire and won Judea its independence. This is actually what's celebrated at Hanukkah every year. Now, this was glorious and unprecedented. Never before had Israel really won independence. It was a really rare occurrence in ancient history. It was wonderful. Things were bad. Something new had arisen. And it was wonderful until it wasn't. The Hasmoneans eventually grew very bloodthirsty. There were civil wars among brothers and literal backstabbings. And eventually the priesthood had become so corrupt that it was replaced by high priests who then gave their loyalty not to the people, but to the Roman Empire. There was a certain amount of autonomy that was maintained, but independence was an illusion, and the people suffered for it. The current system just simply was not working anymore. Now, many people wanted to fix it. They claimed to be the Messiah, or they led resistance groups out in the countryside, just like the Hasmoneans did years earlier. But their tactics were not ones that fit what God was saying. They were tactics of violence and suppression. And so God needed to do something new. And so Jesus came and lived not in a mighty palace, not in a war camp, but in a small village called Nazareth. It proved, this proved that a peaceful man from a simple village could save the world more than someone coming from any of those places of power or authority. Now, Jesus provided what was, in some ways, the ultimate break with the old. And through this new covenant, he provided a way of salvation for all people. Now, I don't know about you, but I've had to break with some of my old habits in the past. Uh, just a few weeks ago, I stopped following a lot of the family Christmas traditions, ones that had brought so much joy and excitement to me as a child and to my children. My great-grandfather, Ted Williams, not that one, um, used to have the biggest and largest Christmas celebrations. People from all over the neighborhood would come to his house to celebrate Christmas. And so once down through the ages to my father and to our family, we had all of these Christmas traditions. It was ritualized and stylized and exemplified and was just something that we had so much joy and excitement about. It was the most wonderful time of the year, you know? But as I became older and I passed on the Christmas traditions to my kids, I noticed that things just weren't working anymore. There wasn't that joy. There wasn't that happiness. There was just stress. It wasn't working anymore. I had to break with those traditions. I had to try something new. And so we decided that we weren't going to go and get as many presents this year. Uh, and the ones that we would get would be practical and frankly boring. You know, there's almost nothing new and shiny that we got. And instead, we just sort of relaxed and enjoyed each other's company. We prayed more and we played less. And the magic of Christmas seemed to return to my family. Even if this description might seem very unmagical to other people. Fewer decorations, fewer parties, fewer presents. But it was time to do something new. And I think we were all the better for it. As we enter now the th third week of 2024, I bet there are a lot of things that are not perfect in your lives. And many of the ways in which you address your problems in the past might not be working as well as they used to. These may be related to your health, your finances, your relationship with family or friends 
your capacity to be a more loving and faithful Christian. So as you pray, I want you to think about whether or not it might be time to try something new. Even if the past for you was glorious, whether it was reclaiming the Ark of the Covenant from the Philistines or overthrowing an oppressive empire, things I know you've all done, winning six Super Bowls, nothing good lasts forever. So we are going to need in our lives, in our church, to create new traditions so that our future might be even more wonderful than our past. It's not going to be easy. I don't really know how the Pats are going to turn things around, at least probably before I'm a grandfather. There are a lot of questions about the wider church that keeps me up at night. But through faith, I know that God will open a new way of thinking and a new way of doing things that will lead to an even more glorious tomorrow. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, show me your glory and help me see what new life you have given to me. And this we pray in your most holy name. Amen. Our closing hymn today comes from this red pilgrim hymnal, and it is number 397. Lord, speak to me that I may speak. Let us now rise if we feel comfortable, and let's all sing together. So now go in the peace of being fully known by God. Go in the hope that God has in you work to transform the world. Go in the love of neighbor and in friend. Go to do new things in new ways. And go in the assurance that God still goes with you. Amen. Let us turn to our neighbors and sing. Blessed be the tie that binds our hearts in Christian love.